Rushing Wind Biker Church at 129 Knickerbocker Avenue in Bohemia, New York, the crossroad of freedom and faith. God bless you. Good evening. Good evening. How we doing? Awesome. How are you? Tired. <laughs> it's uh, been a fairly incredible couple days. Um, before I um, I pray and and uh, get into the message, I want to uh, I want to just show our appreciation for everybody who was there yesterday um, and served and was there because um, use really the power of what this is all about. You know the people who serve and the people that make the food and the people who give a smile just a nice response and sometimes just sit and be observed as people who are enjoying being in the company of the people we minister to use speak volumes into this this group that we're blessed to uh, be able to minister to and uh, you make our job easy you know I just want to tell you how much we appreciate you but how much God appreciates you know the people who are kind of behind the scenes but for one night you're not behind the scenes you know we know you pray for us and, and we know that you you participate at whatever level God has called you to and um, it's such a blessing to watch God's people serve and the response that uh, that comes from people who are so distant from God at times and um, I just want everybody to know how much you are appreciated and, and how much the service you bring you know in that kind of event it's uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dramatic statement of God to this community and uh, feel good about yourself you know there's nothing wrong with feel good about the service you're doing for God you know and um, you know, sometimes the people who uh who get to stand up and say a few words of people who are playing some music they tend to get all the the accolades um, but understand all we're doing uh, biblically is collecting the spoils see the people who serve in the trenches and the people that pray and the people that make the food and the people that serve and smile are the ones who are fighting the battles you know and, and I want you to understand the depth of what you do just by being able to serve and being able to smile and uh, and bring some joy to people that it, it softens the battlefield and so when we get to share a word when we get to to praise and sing a song uh, the battles already won and um, and it was a it was a great night last night I want you to know there were a lot of people that were touched and touched in a lot of deep ways and every time we do this we uh, we see God is bringing us deeper and deeper behind the enemy lines. You know, and, and, and something I didn't share this morning is just, you know, tonight I want to share it because this, this is the hardest message I have to give all year. Not that it's a hard message, but when you're in deep ministry and in deep dark warfare, it's, it's uh, very draining for lack of a better word for it and um, you know yesterday you know the the event that we have the intensity of the ministering and the battles that are going on I, I hope you start to understand what is actually you know happening at that event and, and people like myself and people like Jerry who have formed relationships and you create the atmosphere and God is pouring our giftings into our community and, and if you see people have to have to have to slow me down you know because I want to I want to be as available for God and and I want to I want to know everybody that which is maybe almost everybody here that asked me if I had eaten yet yesterday <laughs> how much it's appreciated you know and, and just um, this day understand I have absolutely no social skills on Sunday so I hide in my office 
And, um, you know, after the service, I'm probably not going to be too engaging because sometimes you leave it all on the playing field. Now, do you understand that? And so, um, you know, doing that and then coming here and, and sharing a message on a normal Sunday can be a very spiritually, emotionally, and sometimes physically taxing ordeal. And it's a joy. Um, but there's a recovery time. <laughs> You know, it's like playing a football game and you're banged and bruised and you got to like go into training your trainer's room and, and get worked on a little bit. Well, that's that's what happens, you know. And so um, after the service, just kind of understand today in particular, I'm probably not going to be available because um, I'm not capable of, of, of speaking well socially right now, you know. And so, you know, it's um, it's a challenge. And um, you're going to be blessed tonight because there is none of ski left to give tonight. <laughs> so what you're going to get tonight is all God because I got nothing in the tank. Um, but even that's a blessing. Amen. Amen. So, um, you know, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Um, I have a, a much more expounded um, version of what I spoke on a little bit last night. Because the, what I'm going to speak on today, a lot of it use can understand and not be not feel critical by it and understand because we're people of God um, you'll understand the truths and the, the 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 balance of this story a little better than people would have last night you know and they got what they needed to hear last night so let's come to the Lord in prayer father we we thank you Lord for our family Lord, we thank you for the incredible things you did last night Father, there weren't just seeds that were planted. Lord, there were, there were buds of new life that were starting to be seen. And Lord, there were areas of darkness that you allowed us to, to creep into a little farther than we normally have. Um, Lord, continue the work you're doing in this community through us, through this church, and through our ministry. Uh, but tonight, Lord, just encourage us and speak to us through your word. Lord, just like today, we're going to be talking about three unsung characters that are within the story of Jesus Christ. Let us all know that we are all important facets and in individual lives in the movement of Jesus in this world. Lord, bless your people. Give them an ear to hear. And Lord, just uh, do what you want to do tonight. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we, um, as we read through Scripture at times... Um, we can just read the stories and sometimes we think a lot of the Bible is just filler in between the big events and the important people you know we have the resurrection and we have we have Christmas and then we have stories and we have impactful moments and and then we have characters that flow in and out of the story that's that's written for us and if we believe that this is actually God's written word we have to understand that every single word and every single character within this incredible story of our Savior is vitally important. And, and not to glance over or read over or take anyone or anything for granted. You know, even things like a preposition or an adverb carefully placed by the Holy Spirit can bring a powerful truth within the body of what God wants to tell us in the story. And um, the story of Jesus we kind of wonder why is it still relevant today? I mean, we know. Uh, but why are there even arguments about Christmas? Why are people arguing uh, about what Jesus came and what he did? You know, um, um, and, and you think about it, if God wanted to do something incredible within the span of all of humanity, you know, everyone that's ever lived in every country that's ever been formed and going from, from Adam to whenever the last birth happens, why did he pick that time? It's an obscure kind of time. You know, if God wanted to, to tell a story and do something incredible, what do you think he would do it today with, like, Facebook? <laughs> and, and satellite television? And live feeds? You know, wouldn't it make sense if God were to come today instead of when he came? You know, it's just how much impact could God have in the whole span of the human story in Bethlehem, in the middle of nowhere, 
with a carpenter who never traveled more than 30 something miles from his hometown you know and and, and as we we study the scriptures and the mentality of how God shares his vision for humanity it actually makes sense because God wants to to bring himself glory out of the most obscure almost meaningless times people and places I don't know about you but I'm really glad about that because I'm about as obscure as a possible pastor could be and, and he's doing something pretty cool at least in my my estimation of what he's doing and, and, and the fact that Jesus came in this time and it was kind of like nothing was going on you know profound other than what went on you had nations you had slavery you had all these things going on and God decided to plant his story and, and the the impactful moment in the historical span of the human experience in this particular time you know and and sometimes we think uh, that's way all, all all the way over there don't we it's Israel and it's the Middle East and we're all over here and sometimes, you know, we're, we're in the middle of like a Christian country. And we're in the middle of this. We feel like the church is centered around us, don't we? The American church. Mega churches and stadiums. And, and we kind of think that, that everything out there is distant from the story of God. You know, and, you know, we, we think, you know, what about, what about the person in India? How do they have a chance you know, we got a church on every other block. How does the person in India or the person in Africa or these small obscure little tribes in, in remote places in South America and, and around the, the jungles and the, the uncivilized parts of the world, you know, what about them? You know, they just seem so far from the story of God, don't they? It's like, how is God going to get to them? You know, so we send missionaries. I'm going to bring I'm going to bring Jesus to to Bangladesh. Really? Like Jesus has never been to Bangladesh before. Like he's not there. You know? And, and we we wrestle with this question, how distant is the story of Jesus from people, from places? You know, even even ourselves. Anybody ever feel in their life that they were distant, that God was distant from us? You know, I just didn't feel like he was here. He was somewhere. But there was, there was this gap between us and Jesus Christ. And us and God. And it, it, was, it, was, it was just a long ways away. You know, and so how does God span distances? Well, God created the universe. I hate to let you know this, but the earth is not really big compared to, to God. You know, there is no distance that is a big deal. To God you know and as we look in this story we're going to we're going to um, see kind of how God works in ways that are outside of the realm of what we normally think you know because we have our story and we have our religion and we have our faith and we have the Christmas story and we have Easter and we have all these things what about the person in India you know and yeah, uh, Nazareth 2,000 years ago was like Mastic Beach, Judea. It's like, really? That's, that's where God decided to show up. And why did he pick 33 years in the whole span of whatever the human story is? He came and he planted one man in a 33-year time zone. And he was going to affect all of the human experience doesn't it seem like God could do something a little bigger than that doesn't it seem like he can do something bigger or he should have done something bigger we get frustrated you know like God can't be everywhere you know and wh why there why in this this little place if God wants to interact with humanity his, his creation and he wants to make the profound movement and the profound statement and actually come as a, a as a, a, a flesh and bones human being why in this stupid little town in the middle of nowhere when all they could do was yell across the street to communicate? You know? They probably didn't even have the cans on a string that we used to play with with kids. 
You know? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know? Yeah, it was just, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you, you know. And so now we're in the church and we, we have this thing of, we know God loves us, right? We know God has sent, John, God sent Jesus for us. But if God is the God of all creation and God of all the world, then God didn't just send Jesus for us, he sent Jesus for everyone. He's the God of everyone. So everyone has to have accessibility. Everyone has to have the, the, the ability to, to have God touch them, to have God reach out to them. Because if he's God of everything, and he's the God of us, he's got to be the God of everybody. And God is a fair God. And God is a righteous God. And, and God has patience that none should suffer. And none should, should be condemned. And none should be lost. So how do we navigate through all this stuff? You know, we're in a Christian nation. There's only a handful of, com of countries in the world that are considered Christian nations. Well, what about the rest of the world? What about the, uh, the Aborigines in the, the woods in Australia? You know, and these other obscure places. And, and like I said, we think we're doing God a big service by sending people there. Like he can't do that without us. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. Because people need human interaction. And people have things on their hearts. But you can be frustrated think, okay, we got people here, but we didn't get that far. We didn't get to the next village in the woods. So how does God encompass and reach out to everyone? Because it, could there possibly be a, a distance that is too far for God to reach, for God to touch people? That's not fair. That wouldn't be the God of creation. And so we open the book and we read this story. And it's a story of uh, the nativity scene. We all have a nativity scene, right? Yes. I hope we all have a nativity scene. <laughs> it's kind of a, an important thing here. And we got characters that are in the nativity scene. We got, we got shepherds, right? We got our shepherds. And we got sheep. And we got Mary and the baby Jesus. And we got Joseph. And if we have a few extra bucks, we get a couple of angels we can put on the roof. <laughs> and if you're well off, you can have a cow and maybe a donkey. Donkey's always laying down. You ever notice a donkey's always laying down? <laughs> it's kind of weird. I don't know why a donkey's laying down. You know? And then there's these three guys. These three guys who have worked themselves into the story. You know, and, and we call them kings we sing these three kings we three kings and uh, the King James calls them wise men you know and we have quotes like wise men still seek him you know anybody ever hear that it's like a Christian cliche yeah there you go I didn't even notice that thank you <laughs> that's how aware I am tonight right you know and so these guys, and, and for the longest time, these guys just, they're there, all right, they're there, and then they're not there, and the story continues on, right? The story continues on. But if every single word and every single preposition and verb in the Bible actually has powerful importance in the story, in the continuum of the conversation of God, don't you think three people that show up might have a little profound, you know, importance to the story of what God's doing in this in this world and this humanity you know and, uh, and we look at this and we we read this account in, in Matthew and the thing about the Bible that we need to understand is the Bible is not just a faith book the Bible in its time was the most accurate historical document ever put together and so times and places and people and kings and life and death and wars and everything else was was true history and it's still true history. You know, and, and people don't want to don't hear a lot of that. But there's very little in the Bible that's actually faith stuff. Most of it is documented history. And you can check with the, the historians of the days. People like, like uh, Josephus. And the early church fathers that carried the histories like Polycarp. And ones that continued the stories. But it was all historical accounts. And then you have Luke. Luke, Luke was a, a doctor and he was a historian. He was obsessed 
with details and facts. Sort of like me. It's kind of OCD. You know, when you read Luke, he has a lot of details. Not a lot of faith, but details. He tells the story, and he has the facts. That's why he wrote Acts also, because it's the Acts of the Apostles. It is the history of the Apostles. Now, who better to write it than a historian? So everything we read in the Scripture, understand it's important. You know, when God says Bethlehem of Judea, it's, it's because it was in Bethlehem of Judea. You know, we could think about the birth of Christ, and we could think about these stories, and not, not talk enough about the places, the stuff that was going on, the people that were in power. And, and I want to talk with this portion of Scripture. You heard me read it last night. This is going to be a little more intense and a little broader understanding of what's going on here. Um, and I think Matthew wrote this for a particular reason. Because Matthew was a, a nobody. Matthew was someone who was far from the God story. You know, he wasn't a person sitting in the temple or sitting in the synagogue. He actually was the one scamming his own people. That's pretty far from God. When you're in the Jewish history as the one who's scamming your own people. You know, so Matthew writes in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, the people are important too. And they play a big part in these stories. Magi from the east arrived from Jerusalem saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east. We've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests, the scribes of the people, he inquired of them, Where is the Messiah to be born? They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will be my shepherd, and he will shepherd the people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. For when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country another way. Now words in scripture are important, right? God spoke everything into existence with his word. What happened in church history is these, these 66 books are the original books that were scripture before they were put together in a book. That's why they're here. It's what, what the Holy Spirit gave to the church fathers and the people who were called to write God's word down. There were 66 books, but they were never put together. And what happened was religion formed and the, the Christian experience expanded and denominational and, and the Roman system of, of church started to take hold and, and then uh, they started doing things that were not quite what was in the original scriptures. So then they, 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 they canonized the Bible, but they already had religious stuff they had to do. You know, and, and sometimes they would, they would pick up the original scripture and say, well, I don't like what that says. We got to change that a little bit. And so when the Bible got canonized, there were certain things that were added, certain things that were corrupted, you know. And so when people come to us and they say, well, you know, man wrote this. On a lot of levels, they got a point. But in the purity of the scriptures, they're dead wrong. Because the scriptures in their initial writings, in the original languages, are infallible, indelible, and cannot make a mistake. And they are perfect in every way. 
But what happened is when they decided to put these all together and copyright God's book, they had agendas. So they added books who are still in some Bibles, and then those were actually taken out later when people kind of looked at it and said, well, those weren't in the original, and some kind of actually doesn't go along with the original. And so words they even changed. One of the words they changed is, uh, is this word baptism. Now, baptism means full immersion. It means your whole body goes under the water, and then your whole body comes out of the water. But there was denominational methodologies that had arose, arisen. And so, see, the, uh, the true translation of the Bible should have been, baptizo in the Greek should have been translated in the words, and they were submerged under the water and then came back up. But it didn't say that because they were sprinkling people and children. And so, so I said, okay, we can't translate that word the way we like to, so we're just going to keep the word the way it is. That's why we have baptism. You know, they took baptizo, they didn't like the definition, so they said, we're going to take the word, we're going to put it in the Bible, and we're going to have it mean what we have already perceived it to mean and what we're doing. And so they took the original meaning because they didn't like it. They didn't like it. And there are some instances in the Bible where they just took a word and it didn't go along with what they wanted to be true or what they started practicing. And so they changed it. And so, yes, there are a lot of translations of the Bible and each one's got its own little, little mistakes. Doesn't mean they're not credible for us to use. If we're true seekers, we're going to seek for, for the truth. And it's not just a pastor that should have a concordance and, and, and a Greek lexicon. You know, you can go on Blue Out of the Bible online and you can get the Greek words and the Hebrew words that were originally put down by the writers. And we all have that available and we should kind of go to that if we need to. Not just the pastor. Amen? Amen. We're all responsible for that. So now this story happens and say, I'm really glad that the, 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 the version I read says Magi. Because Magi is what they were. You know, were they wise men? In a way. Were they kings? In a way. But Magi complicates the story. You have the religious people and they got the nativity scene and you got Jesus, the Son of God, and you have Mary, mother of the Son of God. I made a mistake this morning and I used the Catholic phrase. And Jesus is not the mother of God. Jesus is the mother of the Son of God. Okay? <laughs> And as Joseph, Joseph's one of the unsung heroes because Joseph was just a hard-working dad and a husband. You know, he gets no fanfare, you know, but he taught his son how to grow up to be a man. And he put a hammer in his hand and he gave him a trade and he showed him how to do things and he provided for his family, you know. So Joseph's kind of the unsung guy in the story. So he's there and then the angels, the angels always get, get fanfare and uh, and. Sheep and, and shepherds, they get all kinds of stuff throughout the Bible. You know, Jesus is the good shepherd. And it's good. We got the shepherd and nativity. We kind of can tie that in. It's a continuing thought throughout Scripture. We're sheep. Right? So we get to continue that. Magi, like, were there. They vanished. Were there. They went home. Right? What's the purpose of the Magi? Why even talk about them? See, the word Magi comes from the root word which is where we get the term magician. Magician. And actually the word magi, the word that's used, in Acts that word is actually translated sorcerers. See, it's Simon the Magi. Oh, that's a, that makes it really complicated now. Because now we got the holy scene and Harry Potter is in nativity. We get Harry Potter in. And, and, and whatever the other names of those people are. Now they're part of the nativity scene. The sacred story of God has got witches and stuff going on there. Uh, how do we deal with that? Well, we call them wise men. We call them kings. But the fact of the matter is, is they, they were from a, a distant country in the east called Persia. Persia is modern day Iran. You know, and actually if you read scripture and kind of prophetic things... There's what's called the, uh, the Prince of Persia, which is a demonic entity that kind of controls that portion of the world. 
But Persia, the pre predominant belief system, and what these Magi were, were followers of this, this man called Zoroaster, who had come up with this philosophy called Zoroasterism. And it was astrology, and it was uh, magic, and it was sorcery. And they were also known as alchemists. Alchemists. Alchemists are people who can take like ordinary stuff and through magic and sorcery and whatever they can make it into really cool stuff. Like gold and frankincense and myrrh. They could take dirt and they could do what they do and they would have gold. Now whether that's true or not, but that was what they were known as people who could do. So now these people are part of the nativity scene. And it's just messing everybody up. You know? And, and so, these, the more I study, these three characters in the nativity are much more important than what God's doing in the world. Than maybe even the shepherds. And, and maybe even the sheep. Because their part of the story is God speaking to the entire world. Because what happened with these three wise men is they were seekers of the truth. See, there are people that are in all kinds of faiths and all kinds of methodologies and, and even mysticism that in their spirit and soul are actually seeking for truth. Which is a very honorable thing to do. Because the Bible says, if you seek me, you will find me. You know, and they were seekers of the truth. And so they watched the stars. And they watched the planets. And they saw what the earth was doing. And somehow in, in what the creation spoke to them, part of their faith belief was that this God or, or the creator would one day send a redeemer of humanity that would be born of a virgin. Imagine that. Within the Harry Potter story. There's a redeemer that's going to be born of a virgin. And, and as much as we like the nativity scene, understand the three magi were not there. They weren't at the stable. They weren't at the, the manger. Because they had traveled for two years, they were seekers. They had all of creation that told them that the redeemer was going to be born. And they watched, they watched creation align. And, and the star that was, was seen in the sky was a scientific astronomical fact and phenomenon where several stars, several planets, all aligned in one line, in one place, in one time. So that it was a star that appeared that was never before and was never since. And it was all these things lining up. And they knew it meant something God was was doing something this creator even though they had all these beliefs so they followed the star and they came and they they worshiped the king isn't it interesting that they found the story of God in a mystic philosophy if you read the story who's not at the manger Who's not there? The priests aren't there. The teachers of the law aren't there. <coughs> and you just saw that they knew that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Yet they weren't there. But the people who seem so far from God, entrenched in another faith, another mysticism, witchcraft, things that we go, ooh, uh, witchcraft. Yeah. They were the ones who found the Messiah. There is no distance God can't span. Because the Bible makes it clear God speaks to us through all of creation. He speaks to us through that sunset. He speaks to us through the eyes of a newborn baby that's put in our arms and we, we see the miracle that's beyond understanding that there has to be a God that did this. And He speaks to us through everything. You know, Abraham, the father of our faith, found God in creation. 
He didn't have a book. Kind of responsible for writing the book. But he didn't have a book. All he had was sunrises and sunsets. And he had stars in the sky. And he had animals that he could look at and kind of like, well, that's pretty cool. That couldn't have just happened there. And he was a seeker. And because he sought God, God came and met him. And that's the fact of this human experience. Is, is when people seek God, God will meet them. The problem with other religions and other philosophies and spiritualities is seekers stop seeking when they've been convinced that the journey has ended here. Whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Hinduism. You know, there are sincere people that are Muslims, that are, that are in Buddhism, that are in Wiccan, that have been searching for truth. And they just came to a place where the people around them and, and influence has convinced them, well, we've arrived at truth. And we wonder why they still have wrecked lives. You know, I have friends that are Buddhists. I have friends that are Hindu. I have a lot of friends that are into Wiccan. And they do their things. And, and they, they say their little chants. And they, they, they lay and they face Mecca five times a day. And God does nothing. God does nothing. Because they think God does nothing. He's just there. You know, and it reminds me of, of the, uh, the philosophy and the self-help 12-step programs. That it's a God of your own understanding. And, and you know, the God of your own understanding could be a chair. Or it could be this. Or it could be a tree. Or it could be anything. See, when we look at the other faiths and we look at the gods of Hinduism, and we look at the god of Islam, Allah, they're nothing more than a chair. That's all they are. Because there's nothing. They're praying to nothing. They don't have a trust. They don't have no interaction. They have nothing. And the people are stuck in a place where they've been told, this is it. You've reached the place you got to reach. And, and when, they, when they have problems in their life, they're, they're a wreck. They're a disaster. You know, and a true seeker that really wants to seek God and what life is all about has to seek past and reach to a point where there's got to be a purpose. There's got to be goodness if God created us. There has to be something great at the end or at least great in the middle or somewhere. And they seek and they keep seeking. And, and when someone convinces them this is when we're resting, well, this doesn't seem like the best God can do. And a true seeker will, will press through past what they're in. Whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Islam, whether it's Wiccan. But they, too many have been convinced that this is where you settle in. And this is what we got. And it's not that great. It kind of helps me in my head a little bit. You know, there's so many people I minister to online. You know, I do a lot of ministering in Facebook. And, and people are Wiccans. I have a lot of friends that are witches. And they have their little altars. And they have the, the goddess. And they have all this stuff. And I have friends who are Buddhists who they come to me and say, you know, what do you do about this stuff? Life just kind of sucks. You know, what, what's, what's about that? And I got these people that are asking me to pray for them. And, you know, in my heart I want to say, you got your God. Why don't you go there? Because they know nothing's going to happen. But that's what they believe faith is. They've stopped seeking. Well, these three men decided they were going to keep seeking. And they found the Messiah of the world, and they found the Son of God through witchcraft, through astrology. And these are things that people in church are afraid to talk about. As oh, we got you know, you know, good Christians to start wondering about Wiccan. They might get themselves in trouble. You know, complicate their faith. Either our God is true or he's not true. Either we have God or we got nothing. You know, this morning I read in the paper, on the paper, online, that somewhere down south, there's, the Christians are in an uproar. They got a nativity scene the town put up. And right next to it, a Satanist put a Satan altar thing with the goat and this pentagram and everything else. And the Christians are in a uproar. Like, oh, oh, they're corrupting. You know, it's like, oh, that's not right. That's just bad. You know, that's just 
You know, God is good. That's bad. You know, and I'm looking and I'm feeling so sorry for these people. Like, like, like this guy can affect what God's going to do. In my viewpoint, you got a nativity, line the rest of them up. I want them right there. Because God's going to knock them all down. Amen. Done that in the Bible. You know? I want an attitude like Elijah. You know? You got Baal? All right. I'll put your altar right here. I got my altar of God. All right? We'll see what happens. If you don't know the story, God kind of wrecked the Baal situation. Yeah? Because God's going to show himself as God. We should not be intimidated and we shouldn't be scared of every philosophy out there. The fact of the matter is, is there are people who have found Jesus Christ through a journey that went through Satanism. And there are people who have found Jesus Christ that went through a philosophy that was wicked. God will use anything. Amen? Amen? You know, now we know that there's only one way to God. Right? It's Jesus Christ. There's only one way that man can come to God. But there are many ways that they can find Jesus. If they travel the journey through Buddhism and they keep seeking, they will find Jesus. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Buddhist philosophy. See, you see, Buddhism is not against Jesus. They kind of like Jesus. You know, and, and you know, I've heard you know, uh, gurus or whatever they're called, the, the, uh, the Dalai Lama, and, and they say, it's really funny when you hear them, it's like, you know, their whole philosophy is inner peace. They reach a place of calmness and peace and, and no stress and everything in the world. And then somebody who's Buddhist becomes a Christian. And, and you hear these, 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 these monks or whatever say, it's like they cheated. We're supposed to live and come back and live and come back and being reincarnated and get a little closer. They cheated. And when they see someone who comes to Jesus Christ and they really feel the peace of God and the understanding, they've arrived. But they cheated. <laughs> they work hard enough. You know, and, and the Buddhists know. And actually when a Buddhist comes to Christ and that, that person who comes to Christ experienced the peace of God, the Buddhists are happy because they believe there's all kinds of er er uh, ways to get there. But they think Jesus is like you know, ch cheating. You know? And we look at all these philosophies and we look at these things that are out there and sometimes we're, we're afraid of them. Aren't we? Like God's in competition. Really? You know? The, the way you get people to understand that a philosophy is faulty is let them be in it and let them be alongside you when they go through stuff that that's not going to fulfill. And a door opens up in a conversation. I have a Buddhist friend who's in one of the clubs. A couple months ago he came to me and said, he said, Ski, I don't know what it is, but every time I drive down William Floyd Parkway, because he lives by me, I pass this, this mosque uh, on, the, on the east side of the road. And every time I pass this mosque, I just get anger. I get, and I don't understand why I'm getting angry. I'm not supposed to get angry. You know, I, I meditate and I do all these things. So, I pass the mosque all the time. Uh, I got Muslim friends. I pray for them. You know, I love them. Um, it kind of is the Buddhist ideal. And he doesn't understand that there's such a demonic grip on that religion that it affects him because he doesn't have the spirit of God. He's got the spirit of man. He's got the philosophies of man that doesn't hold up when really the spiritual battle comes into play. But I'm praying for him because I know eventually he'll, he'll look for answers he can't get. So I'm allowing him to be B Buddhist for a while. I'm loving him. And I told him, you know, and I've said this before, you don't have to be a Christian to be in this church. You don't have to be a Christian to come to this church. People know what we're about. We're going to love them. We're going to show them Jesus Christ. We're going to let the Holy Spirit do what He does. Amen? You know, and we should be afraid when somebody comes in here that they're going to corrupt God's kingdom. They can't corrupt God's kingdom. 
They can't. Because God is God. Now, it was one of my favorite, favorite uh, lines in a movie, in the Ten Commandments, the very last line of the movie. You know, we can all picture, a, you got Yul Brenner, Pharaoh, sitting in his seat, and his wife is there. His entire army has been wiped out. His son is dead. And the last line of the movie is, their God is God. That says everything. You know, they had their gods. They're the same as any other gods that everybody else has. They're no more than a chair. You can build a big statue. You can make it a cow. You can make it a goddess with 12 arms and a snake and whatever else the Hindus have. It's a chair. <laughs> That's all it is. You know, we got the only God that makes a difference. We're the only God that's real. We got the only God that'll put a star in the sky so people two years of distance away can find God from a mystic philosophy. Because God laced their philosophy with a little bit of his story so that people that were seekers would see within their own story and they would find God and they would find the Messiah through their own story. But like I said, the, the people who weren't at the nativity were the high priests and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And, and the more I read the scriptures, the more I can understand sometimes the closer you are to the truth, the harder it is to see. See, that star was encamped right over Bethlehem, right over the whole area known as Jerusalem, Israel. But they were too lazy to look up. It was right right there. You know, and, and my experience with, with, with Christ was I was raised in a church and then my mother got radically saved and went to other churches and I couldn't stand anything I saw. I didn't see the light of the world. I saw a lot of craziness. I saw a lot of mundaneness. I saw a lot of stuff that was just disconnect with life today and it wasn't until I pushed all that away and I made a distance between me and the God story people made it that I could see the truth see when you're two years of distance away and you see a star all you have to do is look like this and you see it in the distance you don't have to look up most of the Jews back then weren't looking up anyway but that's a story for another day. You know? And so we look at these, these people. And, and I think most of us that have come to Christ, I think it came from a distance. I think many of us have, gotten, have gone so far from God that we could see Him more clearly from a distance than we ever could when we sat in a church in the middle of the story because of what they've made it. And it gets cloudy. And you can't find Jesus in the religion. And all this other stuff people are telling you. Because the fact of the matter is, is those Pharisees and, and, and Herod, so, so think about Herod. Herod was king of God's people. He was the king of God's people. He didn't know where the Messiah was going to be born. What does that say for the king of God's people? He had to call in the experts. You'd think the king would know. The whole nation's waiting for the Messiah. I don't know. Let's call in the people who know. You know? And the thing about, about a king, the king of Israel, when the real king shows up, oh, I'm not going to be king no more. That's why Harry got twisted. This is the story of us all. We want to be king and lord of our own life. Then Jesus shows up. How do we react? Let's get rid of that thing. You know, I want to be king of my life. This was Herod. And Herod was so adamant that he wanted to hold on to his kingship that, that he, he mandated all the babies get killed. He knew that from the star and what the, uh, the three magi said, it was about two years ago that the star appeared. So he had all the children under two years old massacred. Got to get rid of this thing. And then, you know, Mary and Joseph, they, they flew to Egypt. It's kind of funny when you think about the Israel coming out of Egypt 
and the Messiah comes and he's got to hide in Egypt interesting twist on the story um, anyway I think most of us have come from a distance in our life it could have been years ago it could have been you're still on the journey but sometimes I think it's better to be far away you know but we have to have an understanding when we deal with people out there because we condemn people who are into other things we don't allow them to be in other things and we want to rip them out of their lives and put them on our path understand that somebody who might be a devout Muslim if we can just let them know that if they keep seeking they will find and we, we share our, our love and we share what Jesus is in us but let them continue their journey and put enough questions so that they look within their own faith because Jesus is going to be seen in all creation it says the whole world shows God's glory and what is it Jesus said you can shut everybody up but even the rocks will declare God to the world the rocks you know I think we need an understanding that Jesus can be found in every philosophy out there you th they go through it just let them see what we have let them see the peace that we have let them try to get it in their own way and when we get when they get to the dead end they're going to be hungry because what happens is when you get to that rest stop that they've been convinced to stop on the other side of that rest stop tends to be a wilderness they don't want to go into the wilderness as much as this God is nothing and is not doing anything you know that that journey seems rough and we encourage them to go through the wilderness because that's where God is found it's through the wilderness and it could be through Wiccan I have many friends and they know what I'm about it's amazing when you let people sit in their own stuff when they start asking you to pray for them because they know your prayers tend to <laughs> do things and their little altars and stuff is just superstitions Yep. within different faiths there are paths like I said the, the Dalai Lama and Buddhist leaders have stated that when somebody comes to Jesus it's like they cheated the system and they got there without the reincarnation and the traveling that we're supposed to be because you're supposed to endure the process of purification through sometimes multiple lives to get to nirvana which kind of is interesting is perfect nothingness it's like I'm going to fight through life. I'm going to struggle. I'm going to hold on to peace. And I'm going to try to grasp it so I can get to nothing. So I can be nothing. Yeah. It's the epitome of no pain. There's no joy. But there's no pain. I can just get to perfect nothingness. No more pain and misery. But no more joy and happiness either. Yeah. And, and as, I, as I close, I'm going to say a couple things. Um, Zoroasterism has a belief they're still around by the way they're one of the most ancient philosophies that are still around and like I said they had a belief that the, the redeemer was going to be coming as a uh, as a child born of a virgin the Native American religion the great spirit has many things that are in the Bible interlaced in it they believe in the flood there was a flood and there were other aspects of our story that they've been shown through creation that God has told them and they're on that's why you go to most reservations in the country and they have their native, native American philosophies but you will usually find a Christian church on the reservation you know I've been blessed to be part of a prayer uh, thing where there was the, uh, the pastor of the Presbyterian church in the Shinnecock reservation so there's a connection through Native American philosophies to the great spirit who is Jesus Christ and if they seek through their own religion they will get there you know and you look at um, astrology I believe that in no small way Abraham was was moved by God to see God through the stars and just the wonder 
and, and the symmetry and the beauty of creation. I'll just tell one little story and then we're going we're gonna to wind down. I have a, I have a friend who um, used to be a radical Islamist. He was a terrorist. A lot of innocent blood on his hands. He was a devout Muslim. Devout Muslim. He worshipped Allah with every ounce of his being. Allah was God. He dedicated his life. And the funny thing happened, he came to the United States for the purpose of joining what is cultural jihad. He came here to infiltrate our culture and work within the culture to bring in the, the Muslim way of doing life in Sharia law. He was a powerful leader. At one time he was Yasser Arafat's number one guy. That's how powerful this guy was. So he came to the United States and the funny thing happened, he had a bad car wreck somewhere in the Carolinas. And he was busted up and probably should have died. And they brought him to the hospital. And everyone in that hospital, the doctors and the nurses and the therapists, they all went to the same Baptist church. And they just loved on him. They said, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. God is good and God's going to fix this. Everything's going to be fine. And they took care of him and they, they nursed him and they, they shared the love of Christ with him. They didn't know who he was. They just knew he was from the Middle East. They may have known he was Muslim, but they didn't know who he was. And so they nursed him back to health. And when, uh, when the bill came, because he had no insurance, he, he found that the, the church that these people were in had, had collected the money to pay off all his bills, thousands and thousands of dollars of medical bills. And, and, and when he needed therapy, they wanted. They had to release him, and, and he had no no insurance. So, uh, a couple took him in. A Christian couple took him into their home to nurse him the last part of the journey, uh, back to health. And and uh, you know they they prayed what prayed over him every night. And, and the kids came in, and they would say grace, and you know they would treat him like he was Uncle Kamal. And they would just love on him. And he said he just got more confused and he got angry. How could these people show me this kind of love? How could they show me this kind of love? It doesn't make any sense. They don't know who I am. So it came to the point where he was going to be uh, leaving because he was healthy and he cried out one night. He was in his room and he, he got on his knees and he faced Mecca and he prayed to Allah. And he said, Allah, these, these people, they, they have a relationship with their God. They talk to their God and their God speaks to them. He said, Allah, I wish to have a relationship with you. Let me know that you're real. Speak to me. Show me your, your presence. Dead silence. And he continued and he petitioned. He said, Allah, I have given my life to you. I've given my service to you. Let me know that you're real. I want to have a relationship with you. Nothing. Then he threatened Allah. He says, Allah, if you don't let me know right now, I will curse you. I will curse you. You're not my God. Nothing. And he was there on his knees in frustration. And he said, okay. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you're real, I want to know you. And Jesus showed up in the room because he, pro he finally wasn't praying to a chair. He wasn't praying to a rock. He wasn't praying to a false god. Because our God shows up. Amen? Amen. And these three magi, I'm not going to read, I have it up there, but I'm not going to read the last four verses. Interesting, they came to Jerusalem and they said to Herod, where is the king of the Jews going to be born? He wasn't their king. He wasn't their king. He was the Jewish king. But they knew that king was the king. Even though it wasn't their king. And so they came and they worshipped and they bowed down and they brought him the most extravagant gifts knowing that he wasn't their king. He wasn't their redeemer. With probably a hope that maybe this king could somehow become their king. But he was king of the Jews. 
and then they went their way. Can you imagine, 33 years later, when the first missionaries come out of Jerusalem and they go to Persia, and these three kings, these magi, hear the good news that the king can be your king too. It's what happens in this place. It's what happens in this world. It's what happens in our community. When people come in that front door, they see a star, and they see welcome home, and they've been on a journey, a lot of them more than two years, and they see that, and there's a hope, and people come in here, and they're so far from God, and some of them have had challenges with God, and they, they come here and understand what is in the inner workings of their soul is perhaps their king can be my king, and that's why people walk in here. They're seeking. God's doing incredible things. You know? And people that we think are so distant from God. You know, for those who were there last night, upwards of 20 or more people there are Wiccans. They're active witches. They're my friends. They asked me to pray for them. They're on a journey. I'm trying to nudge them into the wilderness. But I'm loving them. And I know that God will show Jesus to them through their own philosophy if they seek and press through it and not settle for the mundane answers that they have and what they think is real. That if they seek and, you know, and when you pray for people, you have an opportunity to say, you know, God wants, God wants a, 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 a great purpose in your life. And God wants, wants you to have fulfillment and wants you not to be wrecked when something happens. And, and, and then they go back to their little altars and they go back to their philosophies and, and they, they try to get it through that. But they know there's a hope out there and, and there's a star and there's a child that was born and he's not my king but maybe there's a chance he could be my king because what I have isn't working. See, if Zoroasterism was the fulfillment of everything a human would want the three wise men wouldn't have traveled for two years. There was something missing. And they found it at the end of the journey. Amen? Amen. So as we move into this Christmas season, um, we, we have the, the greatest thing that God has ever given to this humanity. And um, we shouldn't be afraid of other people's philosophies. We don't embrace them, but we allow them the process of moving through those things. Because then Jesus will be seen. You know, because they will come to whatever their philosophy falls short on. And we just show them the joy and the love of Christ. And like Kamal sitting in the hospital, why are these people loving me? They don't know me from Adam. They probably knew he was Muslim. He had so much not in common with them. He was so far from God. But as they loved him, a light appeared and drew him. And eventually, he put his faith against the faith. And it's Elijah with the prophets of Baal and the true God. Blows him away every time. Yeah? Put a Satanist church right next door. We'll see how that works next to a true church of God. Amen? Let's close. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this, this community. Lord, we thank you for the friends you've brought in contact with us. Lord, we thank you as we, we get the opportunity to share our life with this community. We know some of them are so far from God. Some of them are entrenched in different faiths and different spiritualities. But we know many of them are truly seeking. And Lord, I'm, I'm blessed that you allowed us to share a little bit of our story without being condescending but allowing the space to question their own philosophies and thoughts and compare what you have in us to what they lack continue to use us Father the seeds that were planted last night we ask you to continue to water them Lord we saw buds of possible new life that popped up all over the place last night Lord you're doing incredible work Lord let us be people who move in boldness of love 
and share the gospel in the way that it should be shared with love and serving which our people here do very well we thank you in Jesus name Amen right now saying will you ride with me Lord I know what I want my answer to be when you say will you ride with me can you see that I'm here 
holding on to me when you say will you ride with me can you see that number no man can number riding alongside Jesus but he's calling out to us right now saying will you ride with me Say yes, Lord, yes, Lord, we say yes, Lord, yes, Lord, we say yes, Lord. One last, one last uh, note. Um, there is no distance big enough for God to span. You know that. The people that in this world right now seem so far from God, farther than anyone else, is the Muslims, aren't they? It's like they're like the polar opposite. They're so far from God. And, and like I mentioned, the Buddhists, they say it's just not fair. You know, those people who find Jesus, they cheat. You know? Well, upwards of six million Muslims a year are converting to Christianity and they haven't been handed a Bible they haven't been brought the gospel so what happens when God finds a seeker that wants to know the truth and you know they see what's going on in their own faith and if they question they become a seeker and you know how these people are coming to Christ he's appearing to them when they sleep and you know what the imams are saying it's not fair because we can't fight what's coming to them in a dream. That's a real God. You know? Amen. Father, send us in power. Lord, we just thank you for this time of year. Let us, let us bring the, the risen Christ, the newborn babe, into the house of many, into the lives of many. Lord, let us be that light. Let us be that star that draws people. And they can come from whatever faith they come from. They're just going to see something different here. And Lord, just bless your people. Keep them safe. Continue to work through our families and our communities. We want to honor you with our service, the sacrifice of every breath that we, we take in our life. We owe it to all the glory and the honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.